Good morning, music makers. Welcome to Intune. My name is Leon Harrell. Uh, and on today's show, we're going to focus on talking about developing an intentional practice routine and what that means. Um, before we get started, I like to always say hello in the comments. So if you're joining us for the first time, just say your name, uh, where you're located, and what instruments you play here in the live chat here on YouTube. Um, this morning, I see some activity already. So I see David, good morning, in Toronto. And I see Tony in Australia. Good morning, Tony. And I see uh, Ray J. Jr. Uke, uh, also in Toronto, electric bass, good deal. Um, so it's great to see you all this morning and we always have people uh, sort of join us as the live stream gets rolling. Um, before we jump into today's topic, uh, which is developing an intentional practice routine, uh, I wanna share an update. I've got my keyboard now attached. Uh, so let's just do a sound test. Let me know in the comments if you're hearing that piano coming through very clearly. I'll do a little improv. All right, so let me know if you can hear that. Uh, and we'll just test our overhead camera real quick before we get going too, just so you can see. Okay, great. So I do see some folks saying, yeah, sounds good. Hear the piano nicely, but your audio is low. Let's turn that up just a little bit. All right, so I, I think that'll solve the audio. Um, but if not, let me know. We don't want to over adjust and be too loud, but if it's too loud, let me know. Okay, so before we get rolling, let me know in the comments, um, do you have a practice routine? Is this something you've tried before? Give me a yes or no. Um, if you have done a practice routine, give me a sense of what types of things you include in your practice usually. All right, and we're gonna jump into our presentation for this morning. Um, so let me pull that up real quick. Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> All right, so every week on our show, we tend to take a look at a different tune and we'll work through different problems. Um, we'll highlight different spots in the music that might be challenging and work through those things. And in essence, every week on this show, we're actually going through the practice or the act of intentional practice. So we, uh, as the sort of instructor in this setting, I'm sort of pre-deciding what sorts of things do most people struggle with with any given tune we look at. But what do you do if you don't have a teacher or you're just a self-guided learner, uh, especially like maybe an adult learning piano or some instrument later in life, um, and you want to develop and have a more structured uh, practice and a practice with more intention put into it. Um, I see here a couple comments roll in. Tony says, you know, not a disciplined routine, which is, that's totally normal. Most people don't. Uh, David says, I'm working on touch dynamics. Yeah, that's a good one too. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that today. That'll sort of fall in our coordination section. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about intentional practice, the thing I sort of run into a lot with my students um, is common obstacles people have to learning are, I'm a busy adult. I don't have time to practice. I don't have a lot of time. So when people tell me this, I really, you know, work with them to develop some type of intention to their practice. So sometimes your uh, intentions are based on limitations. Sometimes they're based on um, goals or things we're trying to achieve. But the first thing I want to talk about is goal setting. So when you are trying to practice with some type of intention, we don't want to find ourselves just whenever we have a moment of free time, sit down with our instrument or at the keyboard, and we just begin to sort of ramble, uh, noodle around, play a little bit. Um, and I, I do that too. There's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of joy that comes with that type of practicing. Um, but a lot of times I will find that that is not um, satisfying in the long term. And that can cause me to feel like I'm not making any progress or I don't really have a lot of direction. Um, so one way to tackle that type of obstacle is to have a goal for your practice. And depending on your stage of development, you'll have different goals. 
Um, but, you know, one of the simplest, easiest ways to have a goal is to have a particular piece you're working on, some, something you're adding to your repertoire of pieces that you can play. Um, and, you know, again, it depends on your development. If you're pretty new, maybe your, uh, your options for your repertoire are pretty limited. Um, so you might be using method books or uh, beginner pieces to, to learn your instrument. If you're progressing past beginner and you're into intermediate, maybe you're choosing simple pieces to play. Um, and these might be you know, popular tunes, jazz tunes, classical pieces. It just sort of depends on what your interest is. Um, and then as you get more and more advanced, you might choose other tunes that are harder to play. Um, and these might be, you know, if you're a pianist, this might be classical music like Chopin, uh, Beethoven, Ravel, just different uh, classical composers. Maybe it's more modern uh, jazz pieces. Uh, it just sort of depends on your taste. Uh, and if you play different instruments, it depends on what style of music you're trying to play. But where I'm going with this is it's important to have some goal you're working towards. Um, so when you sit down to practice, it's good to have a piece in mind. And if you're not at a stage yet where you're choosing, well, what, what piece do I have in mind? We want to explore some different types of goals. So a second type of goal um, is uh, practice minutes, number of minutes, so quantity. Uh, and then a third type of goal is accuracy. So whatever we're working through, sight reading or uh, the particular piece we've decided to, to start working on, you know, how accurately are we playing um, that piece. These two things, uh, tracking your minutes or having a goal based on minutes is, is not terribly difficult. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that, if you want to start simply, get yourself some type of timer, like a common, um, like an egg timer from for the kitchen, you know, where you just twist the dial. Um, a lot of times I'll just get my timer out, set it on the keyboard, twist it to 15 minutes, and I'll work on whatever piece I'm, I'm currently trying to work on. That's probably the simplest way to do it. Um, if you want to get more advanced than that, you might use uh, even like your mobile phone. A lot of uh, cell phones have a timer built in. Excuse me. Um, but if you want to go beyond that, um, every week on this show, we talk about a piece of software called Piano Marvel. Um, so Piano Marvel is a computer-assisted um, practicing tool, especially built for piano playing. Um, but you can use other instruments to operate the interface as long as they have some type of MIDI uh, connection. Uh, in particular, drums is a, a second instrument built into the software. Um, but I'll throw a link up on the screen. If you haven't uh, tried that before, if you're interested, visit OneMinuteMusicLesson.com slash toolbox. You can download a free 30-day trial of Piano Marvel. Um, and it is a software service where you subscribe by the month. So if you decide to continue past the 30 days, um, be sure to use our uh, promo code, uh, when you sign up for your account because you'll get an additional 20% off your ongoing subscription um, if you decide to continue that. But we talk about Piano Marvel every week because it's the tool that I have really found to be the best amongst the crowd of these types of softwares. Um, and you'll see lots of things online um, for, for options to practice uh, piano in particular, but other instruments too. But what I like about Piano Marvel is that it is really based in sort of a goal setting approach. Um, and one way they do that is when you log into the software at the beginning of the month, you can decide, you know, what is my goal for the month? Um, so you can enter that in the number of minutes for the month. Um, but beyond that, you can track automatically as you're reading through music and practicing. It's always counting up the, the actual active time you're practicing um, and tracking that automatically. And you certainly don't have to have software to do that. You can do that on paper. You can do that, have some type of practice journal. Um, but I do find that having a goal, a very simple goal of, you know, I'm going to practice 15 minutes at a time. That works really well for a lot of busy adults. Um, people that have more free time than that, um, you know, 30 minutes is a good goal. You could be doing an hour if, if, say, you're approaching some type of performance. You're going to give some sort of concert or maybe you're working to uh, record some video you're going to upload to YouTube or social media. You know, you might be bumping it out to a longer session. But I don't find that 
for many people, practicing beyond 15 to 20 minutes with, with a very clear intention and purpose, you tend to start to get diminishing returns depending on um, sort of your stage of development or what it is you're working on. So shorter bursts of practice I have found to be more effective for many people than longer stretches of practice. The second thing here when we're talking about goal setting is accuracy. So accuracy can be a tough one to do on your own if you're self-guided. Now some ways you can do that, you can of course record yourself uh, practicing and watch the recording back. And that, that's the easiest way to do that is just with a cell phone, just record yourself while you practice. Um, and I do find there's a lot of benefit to doing that if you've never tried it. For one, when we're playing, it is incredibly difficult to be very objective about the sound of the, the music you're creating while you're playing it, especially if you're fairly young or fairly uh, young in your development, um, or if your uh, if your attention is not focused on the sound you're producing, but your attention is very focused on the mechanics of your hands or your your breathing, or whatever instrument you play, whatever uh, physical mechanism you use to make the sound. A lot of times, our our thought activity is so focused on creating the sound, we're not actually listening at all to the sound we're we're making, especially the tone, the quality of the sound. But accuracy is important when we're practicing because we don't want to, just because we tend to uh, repeat lots of repetitions of practicing something, that doesn't mean that it's, it's necessarily getting better or becoming more accurate. So another reason we recommend Piano Marble in particular for keyboard players is it's automatically checking the accuracy of the pitches you're playing and the rhythms you're playing. And it's giving you a very objective score. So it's giving you a percentage, you know, maybe you, you played this through uh, and it got, you know, a 15% or an 18%. In just a moment, I'll load that up on the screen. I didn't load that before our live stream, so hopefully hopefully that won't cause a problem, but we'll, we'll give it a try. Um, but as I'm practicing, I want to make sure you know, that the accuracy is going up. And generally, within my 15-minute practice stretch here, I will uh, play through a piece or a, a short section of a piece. Um, and let's say, you know, I'll, I'll start out, maybe I'll get a 70%. The, the software will tell me that. I'll play it again, maybe 72%. Again, maybe 75 And, you know, my goal is to get to 100% by the end of the practice session for whatever I'm doing. But if I start to notice... You know, maybe I'm on my eighth or ninth repetition and the percentage is going down. Um, it's, it's not improving. I know that I've probably squeezed all I'm going to out of the value of this particular uh, practice session. So when it comes to intentional practice, I want to be aware, am I getting something from the practice or am I starting to venture into that territory of just frustration and diminishing returns because that's not really serving really anyone, especially me, uh, when that starts to happen. So Piano Marble is really great for that because it just it keeps a practice log of every time we play through a particular piece or play through an excerpt, so we know you know how well are we doing. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is challenges. But before I jump into challenges, let's open Piano Marble. Um, give me just a moment. I'm going to open this here in the background. That If the stream starts to stutter just a bit, that's probably why, but it won't take but just a second to get back online. So I'm going to log in here, and I want to switch my screen, and we may have to just take just a moment to, to get settled. Right, give me just a moment to alter that. All right, so on the screen, you should see uh, Piano Marvel in the background. This is the software I'm, I'm talking about. You'll see my face here and you'll see my keyboard uh, down below. Um, so when I am in Piano Marvel, like I said, I can set a goal for the month. You can see right here in the middle, I've set my goal this particular month to 200 minutes. And thus far, I've practiced 108 minutes. It's tracking that every time um, I log in. Uh, good morning, Don. I see you there. Good morning. from uh, Also from Canada. Um, so... Uh, that is talking about um, our goal setting with how many minutes. And then like I was mentioning with accuracy, let's just take a look here. When I'm looking at a piece, 
I'm going to load up a piece I've been working on. Uh, this is the theme song from the movie Somewhere in Time. And I'll give that just a moment to load up. All right, when I'm working on this, uh, I can track every, everything I'm doing through uh, the, the practice chart. So each time I log in, this, this thing will restart so I can just track what I'm doing this particular practice. And it will show me how many, uh, uh, what percentage of how accurate this, the reading was each time. Uh, and it will track how many times I've played through a particular excerpt. Okay, and on top of that, I'm using their practice features built in that automatically choose, uh, you know, excerpts to focus on as we go through. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, so switching back over to the presentation here. Um, when we talk about intentional practice, the second thing we want to do after we set some goals and we're using these different ways of sort of tracking our practice, we want to focus in on different challenges. So as we're playing through any particular piece of music, Ultimately, you're going to find that there are some excerpts or some passages that are giving you certain types of challenges. So let's say, for instance, let's look at this example I've got on the screen here. So when I played through this piece the first time, um, I'll highlight this measures one through four. Uh, and I'll show you on the keyboard here. These first two measures, first three measures really, um, the, the fingering or the where I place my fingers on the keys is not um, completely intuitive and that's because this is a whole tone scale. So I'll play these two measures so you can hear it. All right, and you'll notice as we play through that, my fingers sort of have to do a lot of coordinating to do that. So the first time I sight read through this, that, that didn't feel natural. We've got parallel thirds moving through a whole tone scale, which is a, a difficult um, exercise to play. So when I first read through this piece, I noticed right off the bat, this was going to be a bit of a challenge for me. And this is something that I'm gonna have to uh, break down into a small section and drill this very slowly. And by drill, I just mean repeat this very slowly. All right, paying very close attention to how my fingers are moving. And by doing it really slowly like this in small sections, not the whole piece, all right, I'm beginning to build up what's called a muscle memory. You may have heard that term before, muscle memory. And all muscle memory is, is any, anything we do, it doesn't matter if it's music or not, anything we do that uses physical motion of the body. When we repeat things, and we repeat them exactly the same way each time, we are progressively training our, the, the memory of our muscles to do them without having to consciously think. So as I practiced this, once I identified, you know, this section was gonna be a challenge, I went through it very slowly, repeating it a handful of times. All right, so with Piano Marvel, that's really easy to do. Um, for one, they have a practice feature built in. And in this practice feature, someone at their company has already looked at this piece of music. They've uh, analyzed it and sort of dissected it into what are logical uh, excerpts or sections to practice through. Um, so in this instance, you can see there's three different modes for practicing. You could practice the whole piece at one time or separate left and right hands. You can do it in what they call a chopped mode. And chopped mode is a really good starting place, especially if we're, uh, we, maybe we've sight read through it one time or we've, we've taken a look at the score overall just to get a feel for it. Um, but now we're ready to actually dive in and start some intentional practice. Um, in chopped mode, it's taking us usually, you know, phrase by phrase, hands together, um, and we can choose what tempo is appropriate. Maybe we start at the lowest and work our way up to the full speed. But <clears throat> in the chopped mode, um, I, I can very easily focus on, you know, a phrase of music at a time. Now, if I want to get a little more... Uh, uh, 
broken down than that, I can do it in the minced mode. A lot of times the minced mode is similar in the, the scope or the amount of music that we're looking at, um, but it's breaking it down one more level into hands separate. Um, but a lot of times when you're facing different challenges in music, that's not small enough. You may actually really be having a problem just with um, a couple beats of a measure or maybe just a measure or two of the music. So there's a feature in Piano Marble where we can just click and highlight over a passage, however much music it is, and you'll notice the notes are, are very dark black where we've highlighted and they're sort of grayed out where they're not. And once we do that, we can practice this in prepare mode where we're the driver of the software, or we can do it in assessment mode where the, the software is the driver of the tempo. But once we're in this prepare mode, I can take my time to very slowly read the notes and practice those same motions very easily. All right, and I can repeat this as many times as I like. And once I get to the end, um, it'll go through and tally, you know, how well did I do as I read through that, and it'll show us a little report. Okay, so I really like that as far as drilling in very closely on spots that are challenging. So you can highlight whatever size portion um, you want to focus on. Okay, there's lots of other challenges you might find when you're looking at a piece of music, um, especially if you're sort of self-taught or self-guided. Um, but let me know in the chat if there's a challenge you've been facing or something you're just you're not quite sure how to improve on that. Let me know in the chat and we'll, we'll talk through some of that this morning. Um, and while we're here real quick, I see Henry. Hey, good morning, Henry from Boston. Um, <clears throat> I know that um, many people that watch this show, you're all at different levels. So you're all going to be facing different challenges. So different things you might come into contact with. Challenges reading the notes, reading the, the pitches of the notes. Challenges counting the rhythm. Maybe you're having challenges um, coordinating your, your hands if your instrument's a two-handed uh, type of instrument. Um, it just depends. Maybe you're a wind player. You have challenges uh, working on breathing, long tones, different things like that. Um, so if you do have a particular challenge you're working on, let me know. Um, I do. Uh, David, you mentioned, oh, where was that at? Let me, I'm scrolling back up through my comments. You mentioned you were working on touch dynamic. Yeah, so the dynamics. All right, so when we're working on challenges like that, especially for dynamics, um, I think about two weeks ago on our show, we went through some tone exercises, all right, where we're just counting, you know, one to five or whatever number we sort of establish, all right, and then we're trying to match the, the volume or the dynamic of the sound to the, the number we're imagining. Um, so each week, we'll, we'll try to tackle different challenges, um, but that's one I can recall uh, related to touch dynamics. All right, so... But moving on from that, so challenges is sort of the next thing to think about in your intentional practice. In particular, when you're talking about challenges, you may have some challenges reading the pitches. That's a, a lot of the focus of my website, One Minute Music Lesson, is all about how to read music. Um, so when we're reading pitches, a couple challenges you'll run into are, you know, the, the key signature. Is this a quote-unquote a difficult key signature? Are there lots of sharps and flats? Um, other challenges you might run into are um, there's a lot of accidentals in the piece of music. Let's take a look at this example I'm looking at. So this piece I'm working on right now for myself, um, it's got a lot of accidentals in it. I'm going to switch it back to the whole mode, um, and we'll scan through the score just a little bit. <clears throat> All right, but as we look through uh, the piece, you know, you'll see sections where there's quite a bit of um, accidentals added into the music. All right, and this can indicate a lot of different things, but sometimes it's just um, maybe the music is changing keys. Maybe it's modulating. Um, maybe there's a short passage like this particular passage um, where we're just tonicizing um, some chords outside of the key. All right, but the, the key thing I'm getting at here is, you know, we want to look at our music, scan through, take a look and get a feel for how many accidentals there are. Are there patterns to that? Look for, are we repeating the same accidentals? Maybe they're just in different octaves. Um, are we, um, are you noticing that um, there's, there's definitely not 
um, the presence of certain accidentals. So maybe all of these accidentals are sharp. So there's, there's no flats when we're playing through this piece. Um, so it just depends on the piece and the particular challenge. Um, but often, you know, the pitches themselves, the notes, um, that will be an area people have challenges with. Beyond that, you know, sometimes people will have challenges when it comes to rhythm in particular. Um, and we talk about this a lot on the show. Um, the, the main challenge I find that people that don't understand rhythm very well, um, they struggle to understand the difference between a simple meter and a compound meter. So a simple meter um, is a meter where the meter divides into two. So let's just like play a quick example. Um, so let's say we're in 4-4. Four, four. All right, so I'll just improvise something in 4-4. Four, four. All right, so that rhythm is a simple rhythm. So the, the rhythm itself divides into two equal pieces. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. But the opposite of that, or sort of the counterpart to a simple rhythm, is a compound rhythm. Or so, Yeah, a compound rhythm. So a compound rhythm is divided into three equal parts. So if we were to play that same uh, improvisation, but in a compound rhythm, it would be in 12-8. So we'd still have four beats in the measure, but each beat would divide into three. So it might sound like this. All right, so if we were to count that, we would be counting one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly, one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly. So we're breaking it up in a different way. Um, so if that's a new concept to you, or if you have found over the years, you understand sometimes signatures, but other ones, when you try to count them, they, they just don't add up and make any sense to you. Um, that might be a problem you're facing. Um, and that's one problem I talk about in my book. I have a book called How to Read Music Easily in 30 Days. Um, it tackles that particular problem, but it also talks about all other kinds of problems that people that are either beginning music readers face or people that even, you know, they play their instrument really well and they can read um, fairly simple things, but at some point they do notice they struggle with certain concepts in reading rhythms um, or they struggle understanding like how chords are put together. Um, and that's what my book addresses. All right, um, so if you're interested in that, check out oneminutemusiclesson.com slash book for that. Um, but moving on here, um, so we talked about the challenges of pitch, some challenges of rhythm. A third challenge is coordination. And this is, uh, these are all broad challenges. You can have all these challenges at different skill levels. Um, but coordination tends to be one of the hardest challenges um, that people face when they're learning any instrument, in particular the piano, because you are asking your, your brain to process and, and do a lot of stuff. So, we're, I mean, we're using our eyes to read the music. Mentally, we're counting through and sort of parsing out the data of the notes to figure out how to, to tell our hands what to do at the keyboard. All right, and then beyond that, often the music is having our left hand and our right hand do different things at the same time. Uh, for example, if we look at the score uh, here on the screen, um, you know, we can see there is, uh, in, in the right hand, the top staff here, this melodic line um, is doing uh, very different stuff from the, the left hand. All right, and then our left hand is trying to do something completely different. All right, so we're trying to coordinate them together. So coordination challenges, depending on the level of the music, you know, you can have different levels of challenge to that. But a lot of times slow practice is the ultimate way to conquer the coordination challenges. But beyond that, um, I'll mention a couple things. I wrote a couple notes here. Let me look at this. Um, some things you want to think about when you're, when you're doing intentional practice, you're sitting down to really solve some of these problems um, with whatever time you've allotted yourself, which usually I say 15 minutes. 
Um, you, want, you may want to write in the fingerings for different things. Um, so you'll notice on this score where I've highlighted, you'll see these numbers at the bottom. 2, 1, 5, 2, 1, 3, 3, 2, 5, 4 at the bottom. These are just numbers that correspond to, to the fingers themselves. Um, and the reason we, we write these numbers in the score is that typically the, the notes where these numbers are written under, you wouldn't automatically just naturally use those fingers to play those notes. Um, if, you, if you naturally were going to play those notes with those fingers, there'd be no purpose to write them in because you're, you're automatically doing it. Um, so when you see fingering written in in musical scores or you know maybe you're playing a, a different instrument where it shows an alternative fingering for like a woodwind instrument, we're putting them in because they're not the natural choice. So when you see these fingerings, um, although you don't always have to do what the fingerings are telling you, it's written by the editor of that particular piece of music, oftentimes it's helping you overcome some coordination challenge. Um, so the fingering is usually going to help solve that problem. But you have to make sure you're practicing using that particular fingering when you do it. Um, a lot of times you'll find music where there's no fingerings written in and you're trying to solve a particular challenge and you need to write the fingering in. Um, Piano Marvel doesn't allow you to write things in on the score, but a lot of pieces we can just print the score out directly just using this little icon at the top. Um, or if you're using it from your web browser, you can just hit print from your web browser. Um, but I do recommend students write in challenging um, fingering if that's a particular challenge they're having. Another coordination problem um, that we can come into that Piano Marvel really does help with is drilling through uh, short excerpts with our hands separate. Um, so, uh, like I said, it's built into the practice feature, particularly in the minced um, option. So let's say, for example, this is close to measure 46, so that'll be somewhere down here, uh, right in this passage here. So if this particular passage was really giving me some problems, I might start on um, section number nine here measures 44 through 54 right hand only um, and I'll do it at the slower practice tempo <clears throat> and it's going to load up the score right at that spot all right it's going to only highlight the right hand spot and I can do that in prepare mode like I said where I'm the driver of the tempo so I might read through this really slowly And then we can use the cursor to help us follow along. All right, now I'll keep playing just a little bit more. Oh, sorry, wrong octave. And I love that about Piano Marvel because if you are playing in the wrong octave, it'll tell you. So here you can see in my first attempt, I got five notes incorrect. These are the red notes. It took me 35 seconds to play through that example, and I got 98% of it correct. Um, so I love that feature of it, as I'm, especially as I'm drilling or repeating small sections um, with a very strong focus on correcting some coordination problem. Okay. <clears throat> so moving on beyond that, once we've looked at a piece of music, um, we have tried uh, tackling all the different challenges, we may still find that there are spots in the music that are just uncomfortable to play or maybe they're just outside of our reach at the moment, meaning you know we practice and practice but we're just not getting there. Uh, so some things you might consider doing are looking at some exercises or um, studies or etudes. You'll find these things with, with different words to describe them. But a lot of times exercises will help us build up the actual physical muscles in the hands. Um, it'll also help build the muscle memory for certain obstacles. So if we take a look back at Piano Marvel, there's lots of um, exercises and studies built into the software. Um, in particular, um, there's a classical composer, um, Carl Cherney, 
Um, and he, let's see, am I spelling that right? Oh, let me turn my favorites off. Um, a lot of his um, output um, was these exercises or etudes that pianists could study. So in particular, his School of Velocity is one of them. Um, so if we open up any one of these examples, um, we might find that there are exercises that relate to what we're trying to do. Um, so there's, there's tons of them to look at, and I don't have time to go through all the details of uh, Cherney's method, um, but let's just look at one for an example. Okay, so here we can see this particular example. Um, this is trying to help us understand how to coordinate playing a chord in the left hand and playing um, a scale passage in the right hand. So this happens to be uh, playing a scale down in the middle of the piece, the scale goes back up. And then a lot of these exercises or etudes, they'll also include some, some musicality to them. They're not just mechanical exercises. Um, so we'll see that the patterns that they establish sometimes will be broken just so they're more satisfying musically, All right? But do think about that. If you're hitting a certain challenge, let's say for instance, um, you're playing that, that piece we just looked at at the beginning. So this was the theme from the movie, uh, Somewhere in Time, I'll pull that back up. And as I mentioned, that was um, a challenge for me in that opening passage. We've got these parallel thirds in the whole tone scale. It's, it's just not a natural feel for most people. Um, a, a two or three second Google search for um, finger exercise or etude, E-T-U-D-E, -E, um, for parallel um, whole tone scale, that would result in, you know, some example that helps us practice that type of thing. Um, and oftentimes, many of these very standard classical uh, etudes are built into Piano Marble. There's, there's about, I don't know, 25,000 pieces of music in the library. So in general, you can find just about any of these standard repertoire uh, etude books in the library. Okay, uh, so wrapping up... Um, on this topic this morning. Um, the last thing to look at um, are just additional resources. So like I mentioned, I love Piano Marble because the library is humongous. Um, when we're looking in the library, let's take a look here. Um, if we, say we are struggling with, with various challenges in our learning, one thing we can do is within the library itself, in the genres um, filter, there is a genre for scales and exercises and also methods. Um, so let's do the one for scales and exercises first. All right. And this is going to come back um, with a lot of the, the types of things we were just talking about. So we'll see uh, Cherney's method in here. Um, we'll see Hannon exercises. These are also very common um, hand exercises for a pianist. Um, we'll see sight reading exercises we could work on. Um, we see uh, material from the ABRSM, which is a British sort of standard of teaching music. All right, and then we also see several method books in here, which a method book is generally just trying to combine um, musical exercises or short songs that are teaching us something that helps us overcome these very common coordination obstacles. All right, so that's within the Piano Marvel Library under Scales and Exercises for the filter. Um, in addition to that, you could just do the method books if you're looking for maybe a more straightforward, uh, streamlined approach, especially if you're self-taught. Um, a couple method books I like within this series are the Alfred All-in-One Adult Course. Um, you'll see there's several levels to that course. Um, but there's also um, this Premier Piano course, which is a pretty good one. And uh, naturally, you have the Piano Marvel method built into the system, um, which is what I use for teaching my students. Okay, um, so if you haven't looked at those, those are great resources, especially for overcoming these various obstacles. Let's take a look at this Alfred one real quick. Okay, so the Alfred one will highlight... Um, different elements of what it is you're working on. So like a right hand warm up, a left hand warm up, 
Um, and then it's got little pieces in here that go through different concepts. All right, the, the only thing I think that's not included, so Piano Marble has all the music built in, um, but the actual physical book for this, um, it has more text written in to explain concepts, um, whereas the Piano Marvel material that's built into it directly, if we take a quick look at that um, through the method cabinet, you get the full book itself. Um, so you'll see uh, some of this information uh, filled out as well. So you've got more teaching material built into it. Okay. All right. So wrapping up on resources, um, when you are talking about intentional practice, you may need some additional resources. Um, so I have a lot of those on my website, one minute music lesson.com, but in particular, um, there is the international, um, music score library, the IMSLP, and that is a great resource for anyone to, to get access to uh, more musical scores. Um, you can also find some of these um, older method books like the Cherney uh, exercises we were looking at. Um, a lot of those things are available on IMSLP. Um, I've got a couple other sites that I reference in my website. Um, they're not coming to me off the top of my head. Um, music Notes or 8note.com, I think is what it is. I'd have to look and double check that. Um, but long story short, you may just need some additional resources to help fill in the gaps um, for your practice routine. Okay, so as you're wrapping up your practice, I recommend students jot down what's the next step. So let's say you've practiced for 15 minutes. You've had a goal of what piece it is you're working on. Um, you've identified what challenges you, you might be having so you can look into other resources or, you know, drill through those challenges. But before you end your practice session, you want to write down what is the next thing I need to do so that when you do come back to your instrument, let's say it's tomorrow or maybe it's in two hours or maybe it's in two weeks, you have a record of, of what, what were you thinking right as you finished off that practice session. Um, because we don't want to waste a lot of time, um, especially busy adults don't tend to have a lot of free time, uh, getting reacclimated to what was the next thing to work on. Um, again, another reason I love Piano Marble. So if we're looking at uh, just about anything within Piano Marble, you're going to see there is either, uh, if we're going through the method book series, we've got a trophy cabinet with different numbered exercises to go through and each exercise our goal is to earn you know a hundred or whatever percentage is your particular goal uh, and we're going through them step by step piece by piece um, so when we're practicing you know if I did exercise one and I've completed that I know my next step is to complete exercise two if I'm working on a piece of music um, outside of the method cabinet and I'm just looking at um, my particular piece, so this is the piece I'm working on somewhere in time, if I click on my practice tool down here, it's tracking what I've completed. So this week um, I've completed sections one, two, three, and four. And the next time I sit down to practice this, I'm gonna start on section five because I, I already know that it's tracking it for me. But if you're not using a tool like this, you just want to write down what is your next step. So when you start your next practice, you haven't wasted any time getting back um, to what you're working on. Okay, and while we're here, I'll talk through just a, a, a common misconception. When you are learning a new piece, you don't have to learn it linearly, meaning you don't have to learn it from beginning to end. Oftentimes, if a piece is challenging um, for you, you may find more success to learn it in reverse. And by that, I mean start with the last section, uh, learn that, uh, move back one section, learn that, and put them together, and then repeat. So go back a section, then put them all together. And what you're doing by doing this is, as you're practicing, you're practicing the end of the piece more than the beginning of the piece. And because most compositions, most pieces of music, the, the goal of a piece of music is to keep your attention the entire time. Well, to keep your attention, something different has to happen as the piece goes on. And often that something different 
Is the music's getting more difficult? Or we're, we're jumping around the keyboard or on our instrument in different ranges as the piece progresses. So the more difficult material tend to the And that makes it more effortless for us to, to play the piece by the time we've learned the whole thing. Okay, so that's just a little tip there. Okay, um, so that's tracking our next steps. Um, so really that wraps up what I wanna talk about this morning outside of once you've identified what are my next steps when I do practice the next time, try to jot down just some notes about your practice session. And this might include, you know, how did I feel while I was practicing? Did I have, you know, kind of low energy when I started? Or did I start with really high energy and as I practiced, my energy just sort of ran out? Um, you know, are there particular challenges that I could not solve that I need to look into? So just take some notes on whatever it is you, your thought process was during that practice. Um, and that just gives us a way to track over time, you know, what, what is happening with our internal dialogue as we're practicing. All right, so everything I've talked about this morning um, this falls into the concepts of intentional practice. And this week, I'm going to be putting together um, a, a worksheet or a, a page for a practice journal. I have a practice journal available on my website, OneMinuteMusicLesson.com, but it's, um, it's not as advanced as what we've talked about this morning, so you're, you're welcome to download that. But this week, I'm going to be putting together a new one and I'm going to put that on my Patreon page. So if you are a patron, you'll, you'll get access to that new um, worksheet as a, a part of your uh, patronage. Um, but if you are interested in getting that, um, check out OneMinuteMusicLesson.com slash support. You can learn more about, you know, what is Patreon? How does that work? Is this right for you? That kind of thing. Um, but as we go through these examples um, each week, we'll be talking a little bit more and more about intentional practice. A lot of these worksheets I'll put together, I'll have them available for my patrons. All right, so keep an eye out on that if you are a patron. Okay, that is going to be it for this morning's concept. Um, let me know if there is something that we went over in the chat that you'd like to hear a second time or dive into deeper. Um, we don't have any questions that came in this week, um, but if you have questions throughout the week, I recommend you send them to our mailbag. So OneMinuteMusicLesson.com slash mailbag. And each week, any questions we do get, we try to answer those here live on the show. Or if, uh, if we don't have time to answer them, we try to answer them um, throughout the week uh, directly in email. But ideally, I like to do them on the show um, just so we can all share them as a community. Okay? All right, so that's going to wrap us up for today. Thank you all for joining me this morning as we talked about intentional practice. Um, if you do have questions, like I mentioned, send them to OneMinuteMusicLesson.com slash mailbag or throw them in the comments here on YouTube. Um, we can certainly answer them throughout the week um, on YouTube. All right, thanks guys for joining, and I'll see you again on next week's episode of In Tune. All right, take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye.